So we're going to talk today about one of the mitzvahs that it talks about in the parasha, which is the mitzvah of Lotik Novo. The mitzvah you're not allowed to steal. The Torah tells us in the book of Ayikra, chapter 19, verse 11, portion of Kedoshim. Kedoshim means to be holy. So the Torah is going to teach us how to be holy. One of the most important ways to be holy is, of course, to be honest, not to steal. So we would think perhaps that stealing is a simple thing. Everybody knows you shouldn't steal. We all know that hackers, fishers, people that scam, people that take things that don't belong to them, we know that those are things that are reprehensible, they're morally unacceptable. However, we want to take a deeper look at that today and see that perhaps what we consider just based on our moral instincts as being outside of the pale or outside of the parameters of being called actual theft, we would like to see how the Torah views it. Because as we know, that while there are aspects of the Torah that are totally news to us, that we would never have imagined them were it not for the Torah telling us, for example, the law of not being able to mix milk and meat. I mean, nobody would ever come up with such a law. The Torah came up with the law, and the purpose of that kind of law is hooking. It should be a statute, it should be a, a directive from God that makes us feel that we're doing a mitzvah of Hashem. But then there are other mitzvahs, and those other mitzvahs are things that instinctively we would know. What do you mean instinctively we would know? We're born with instincts, but our instincts are actually selfish. As children, we don't know how to share. We get taught by societal values, we get taught by our peers, we get taught by our parents. So what do I mean when I say instinctively we would know? So the Torah tells us, the Gemara tells us in the tractate of Erevin, that Rabbi Yochanan said, if the Torah hadn't been given, we would learn modesty from a cat and abstaining from theft from an ant. The modesty from a cat, there are certain things you never see a cat doing. Dogs do <coughs> relieve themselves publicly and other things publicly. Cats are not like that. Cats are discreet creatures. They teach us there are some things that should be done discreetly. But what about abstaining from theft from an ant? What is meant by that? So Rashi comments on that statement. Because the verse states, King Solomon states, that she gathers, talking about the ant, Yet she gathers her bread in the summer. In other words, an ant works very di diligently to prepare for the future. You see that schlepping, if you leave, you leave some crumbs out, what you see is very quickly you'll have a whole family of ants, each one carrying, and I think the, uh, if you look at National Geographic, so you'll, you'll be told the ant carries a few times its weight, its body size as humans we find very difficult to comprehend. But why are they working so hard? So Shlomo HaMelech says that the ant is learning, is industrious, it's putting away food for the future. So, why does it have to put away food? Let it just help itself to somebody else's food. This teaches us, in other words, embedded within the creatures of God's universe is already an industriousness, a need that what you prepared for yourself will be there for you. What's for somebody else is somebody else's. So, we would know that thievery, stealing, is wrong from other levels of animal life even around us. And of course, we also have the, 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 the mental understanding that if I'm to steal from him and he's to steal from me, then there's chaos. If I don't respect somebody else's property, I don't respect mine. I want him to respect mine, so I respect his. So, not stealing seems to be something which we ex understand very well. It's an uncomplicated mitzvah. But is it? Or, as we will see, there are many different aspects and nuances of Lotik Novo, as the Torah says in this week's portion, don't steal, which may actually require some work on our part. So, for example, what will happen if you wanted to take something from somebody else as a joke, or to teach them a lesson. You know, you have a friend perhaps, he's a very messy guy. Maybe it's that, I wouldn't try it with a spouse. 
Uh, maybe someone would cry with the spouse and the child. And you see, they leave the things around. I'm going to teach them a lesson. I want to teach them to be responsible. I'm going to take that iPod or that wallet or whatever it is, I'm going to hide it. I'm going to keep it in my, in my cubby. If the person looks for it, eventually I'll give it back. Well, is that permissible or not? The Torah says, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, tells us about that. It's forbidden to steal any amount. Even the following cases are forbidden. Taking something without permission in a joking manner. Stealing with the intent to repay, even if one intends to repay double the amount. Taking something just to bother a victim temporarily. You want to tease the guy. You want to cause the guy aggravation for some reason. All these situations are forbidden so that one not get accustomed to such behavior. Even though you're going to rectify it, you're going to give it back, but we don't want to get used to behavior still. So much so, and I will tell you, that in the Chabad tradition, stealing an Afikoma is considered not something that we should plan in our children. Stealing is not good. So the Afikoma ritual, we try and give a different spin to it, the father will hide it, and there'll be a finder's fee. Finder's fees are okay. We don't want to teach kids, we don't want to teach ourselves to take something even, even as a joke. But those that do have a custom of stealing the Afrikaner, we all know it's not stealing. Why? Because we all know the father wants the kid to take it. The kid knows the father wants to take it. The negotiations at the end to give an Afrikaner gift anyway, the kid knows that the, usually the parents will go and take all the kids to the shop and buy them all something, whether or not they were the one that found it. So it's, it has, it's within a context where we understand it's not to actually steal. But that concept of stealing is something that we have to be extremely cautious about that even if it's done under the guise or even if it's done indeed with the intention of something else, we may not do it. There's a famous story that the Baal Shem was once traveling with his disciples and on the way they passed another wagon driver, Baal Shem Tov asked his wagon driver to please have the other wagon driver stop as well. Baal Shem went and whispered into the guy's ears a few words. The students were sure, the disciples were sure, this must be a mystic. Al the great sage, the great mystic, famed Kabbalist, going and speaking to this uncouth-looking individual, there must be something there. So they followed this other wagon driver, they located him. And when they came home, when they came to his location, they had a discussion, they said, tell us who you are, reveal to us the, the true secret of who you are. So he said, I'll tell you, I'm no one special, and I'll tell you what the Baal Shem Tov told me. He said, I was living a normal life about a week ago in this town that I live in, and I had a good friend. And I wanted to come and tell him, he just, my good friend is a businessman, he is a buyer for a few different uh, people in the village, he gets their cash, and he goes and he buys goods and so on. Well, I walked into his house one day and I saw a large wad of cash on the table. And I thought, see anybody in the house. I said, that guy's so irresponsible. He's my good friend. I have to teach him he has to be more responsible about cash, especially maybe it's somebody else's. So I took the money, I put it in my pocket, went across the street, and I figured I'll come back in a few minutes and I'll give it back, but I'll tell the guy, watch out, right now it was me, and I'm your friend, but it could have been somebody else who really meant to steal it. Steal it. Well, I got caught up in something else in my house. This was about Shantov's times, 300 years ago. And he didn't get caught up in, uh, in checking his emails, but People got caught up then also in other things. And all of a sudden I heard a commotion from across the street. And I heard people crying and screaming about a large amount of money that was stolen. And through the whole tumult and the hullabaloo, I couldn't go into that house to go and return the money. People would think I'm a thief. I knew my friend will understand. Well, trust me, there were all these other people there. Anyway, I waited for a quiet moment. It didn't come. The guy took it very much to heart and I was waiting and waiting until it was already a few days later and I wasn't sure if my friend would even accept that I had done it properly out of proper intention. And now it's a week later and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm just gonna go and move to a different town, just big amount of money. I'll try and be honest from now on, what should I do? The Baal Shem Tov came and told me, whispered into my ear and he said, go back to your friend, tell him what happened, give him back the money, everything and indeed, this is what I did and everything worked out. So even as a joke, even as teaching somebody a lesson, theft is not something that's permissible. Now, what about 
borrowing something without explicit permission. Let's say, for example, you have access, your, your neighbor parked his car. He went off, he's a snowbird, he went off to Florida, and he left his car parked in your garage. And usually, you know, once in a while he lets you use his car, but you never discussed that you're allowed to use his car while he's on holiday and you have While he's on holiday, while you have the car in your garage, this was never discussed openly. You can't reach him because it's early in the morning, maybe it's a time difference, and you want to use the car. Are you allowed to use the car? The answer is, the Gemara says that Rava said one who borrows without permission is considered a thief by a rabbinic law. Not allowed to borrow something without permission on page 44. And we find also a similar law in the Shulchan Aruch, find in the laws of Hoshen Mishpat, the laws of monetary things. One who enters his friend's orchard or garden may not gather fruits without his permission. Although the owner is his very dear friend, he will certainly rejoice about finding out that a friend has, has enjoyed his fruits. The fruit is forbidden because he doesn't know about it at the time. The same is true of all similar situations. And we must caution the public about this, for many stumble due to lack of awareness. This comes up all the time, and we have to be really careful about it. Theft is not just when you go with a gun and say, hands up, give me your money or your life. Theft is even in those cases where you're taking something from an owner without explicit permission, where you don't know, you haven't discussed whether or not permission is granted, and you take something from somebody else, this too would constitute theft, at least according to the words of our sages, which means we have to stay away from it. Now what about stealing as a Robin Hood? You know the, the famous fable or tale of Robin Hood who stole from the rich to give to the poor. Mm. One would think it's noble. The means justify, the end justifies the means. What do we do then? Some think he's a noble character, a compassionate person. Others say he's a dubious person because he was helping himself to the wealth of others, even though he may have had a good intention. So what does the Torah say about this? So first of all, let's remember, remind ourselves that giving charity is a great mitzvah, but getting others to give charity is even a bigger mitzvah. Page 45 here, quoting from the Shulchan Aruch Yoridea, we say that the reward for influencing others to donate is greater than the reward for donating, which would seem to say if I was able to get these rich people who were never thinking of being philanthropic, somehow I'm able to get them to give, it's a big mitzvah. But how am I able to get them to give? Maybe I can, without even them knowing, I can skim something off their bank accounts or somehow charge them extra, put in an extra undis undisclosed charge, whatever it is, and I'm not going to benefit from it. I'll give it to charity. They'll have the virtue of charity. It says in Kohelet, it says the, uh, the King Solomon writes, better, Kohelet is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 6, he writes, better is a handful of ease than two handfuls of toil and frustration. What does that mean? It's a bit cryptic. The Medrash explains, this means one who gives a small amount of charity from his own is better than one who steals, extorts, and exploits large sums of charity from others. The means, the end, sorry, does not justify the means. Charity is only when it's done in a way that it's kosher. Now there's another way somebody may decide to give charity, a more subtle way. How would that be? <clears throat> what happens if two people come before me in judgment? One is a wealthy, uh, miserly, I don't want to use any names, I wouldn't talk about any uh, Jewish people or any rich people anywhere, but uh, Uncle Scrooge, the famous Uncle Scrooge was a big miser. Again, you don't usually get called the name miser unless you're rich. A poor person who's a miser is not a miser, he just doesn't have the means. Uncle Scrooge, who has a lot of money, call him a miser. He loves his money, he doesn't want to give it to anybody else. He comes to court. And who's sitting against him? The other litigant is this poor, homeless person. Uncle Scrooge says, you've been sleeping on my property for the last month. You owe me $100 rent. The other guy doesn't know what he's supposed to do. 
comes along a judge, and the judge may think, you know what? Let me convolute this scenario and say, Mr. Mr. Uncle Scrooge, you realize that because Mr. Homeless was living there for the last month, you avoided a theft, a major theft. You actually owe him $100,000. But, of course, against the law. And the judge may be thinking, Uncle Scrooge is a tightwad, is a miser. Let's turn the court against him and get him to give charity under the guise of law. So comes this week's portion and tells us, this is in uh, the textbook 46, you shall commit no injustice in judgment. You shall not favor a poor person or respect a great man. You shall judge your fellow with righteousness. What does that mean, says Rashi? What does it mean you shall not favor a poor person? When you come to court, you shall not say, the judge shall not say, this man is poor. And the rich man is obligated to provide him with sustenance. Therefore, I will acquit him in judgment, and he will thus be sustained respectably. Respectable way to give, to give support for the poor. Make him win the court case. Torah says you can't do that. Because that's a perversion of justice. What you could do is, and we, we once talked about this, what you could, if the judge is compassionate, he can go afterwards and give charity to the poor person. But he cannot pervert justice. That is considered theft. You cannot help yourself to somebody else's funds in order to create, in order to rectify some kind of a social ill, to rectify some kind of a need. That's done in a thieving way. We're not allowed to do a mitzvah when there's theft involved. So now what would happen though if the only way to survive is to steal? But unfortunately, like if, if people don't have money, they they don't have a choice. So what are they gonna do? Yes, Benny points out correctly, if somebody doesn't have a choice, if he's in the ghetto. No food available. The only way to get food is to thief, is, to, is, is theft. What should he do then? Is he allowed to do that? What happens? So now let's 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 analyze what happens. So let's first say it like this: if there's if there's a danger to life, you do everything except for three cardinal things, which are you know, serve idolatry, you don't commit adultery, and you don't kill somebody else. But theft to save your life, yes, definitely you steal. However. The question will be, if you stole, do you have to pay? In other words, is it just because to save a life, you do anything, almost, except for those three things? And it's to save a life. But it's not like the laws of thievery don't apply. It's just that right now they've been overridden. But that would mean you would have to pay back. So let's hear, interesting, this came up with King David. David HaMelech was engaged in a long-term conflict with the Pelishtim, the Philistines, and one of their tactics was to hide amongst the barley. Okay, sacks of barley belonging to the Jews, and they would attack the Jews from those hiding places. So what do you do? So King David had a solution, burn down the stacks of barley. First you have to establish are you allowed to do that or not? So he, the Gemara says in Baba Kamen, interesting question. David, he referring to King David, asked, may one save himself with another's money? Can I go to battle and burn down the barley of, of, of other Jews without asking them, without getting their acquiescence? They answered, talking about our sages, the sage that answered, it's forbidden to save oneself with another's money. So now the question is, Tosfot asks, the question was not about whether he may do it, because obviously to save a life, you can burn down barley. Continue here from the Tosafot, the commentaries explain this. His question may want to save himself with another's money. What was his question? His question was not whether you can do it. He's going to save lives. He's in a part of a military conquest. He has to do it. The question is, if one saved himself from death by using another's money, must he repay the money? In other words, you not just that you're allowed to steal to save lives. You need to steal. You're required to steal to save lives. If you don't, you stand there, oh, that person is bleeding to death, God forbid, but I can't break down the barrier that belongs to somebody else. That, then you, you're, you're, you're a partner to manslaughter. You've stood by somebody else and not helped them. You have to break their fence down and go, but if you saved your life through using somebody else, burning somebody else's property, do you have to pay it back or not? That was the question. 
So the Rabbi Shlomo Luria, who lived, passed away in 1574, so that gives him right, 500 years ago, wow. he explains as follows. He says like this. It is, it is permissible to save oneself by using another's money without permission, provided the intention is to repay. Indeed, not just is it permitted, one is required, one is obligated in such a case to use all means to save oneself. One who doesn't is responsible for the loss of his own life. It's like he's taken his life, because he hasn't taken the opportunity given to him to save his life. I, you may ask, didn't King David ask the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Court at the time, if one may save himself with another's money, and they replied in the negative. You're telling me that we have to do it. However, the Tosfot, already, as we said, explained that David's question was merely whether or not one is obligated to repay the money used. To this, the Sanhedrin replied, it's forbidden to use the money only if the intention is not to repay. You can't intend not to repay it when somebody else is in doubt. You have to do it to save your life. But you have to know that there's a, a penalty. There's a penalty. You have to pay for the value. So the question is, what is the halacha? The halacha, as we put, point out on page 49, is like this. Even though saving a life overrides all the mitzvahs of the Torah, as we said, aside from idol worship, forbidden relations, and murder, nevertheless, because it is possible to repay, one may only use the money with the intention to repay. So, obviously, you're going to ask, can we take money from the poor and give it to the rich and give it to the poor? You can't even take money to save your own life and not intend to repay it, even if there was real life and death. Similarly, you cannot take money when you see a poor person. You cannot steal it from a rich person. Like what you may do is, if God forbid, somebody doesn't have food and somebody else has more food than he needs, you can take it but with, the intention of with the intention of repaying it. To keep a, you, you, and not just you can't take it, you must take it. If it's that kind of scenario where, God forbid, people are starving, you need to take it. Act first, but you also need to know that it belongs to him. Theft is not charity. Charity is charity. Property is property. So long as he didn't give it, it needs to be repaid. Well, well, if you have a chance to ask permission, you may actually not have to pay it back. The guy who gives it, but there is he, may, he may grant it as a philanthropy. Right, but there is a chance that the person will say no. He will say no. Well, you, if he says no, you can always go and steal it. Again, we're talking about an extreme case where uh, it, it could exist today. Maybe somebody has antibiotics. And again, he just wants a, a high price, which right now somebody can't pay. And uh, somebody has to come and steal it. I wonder how that would translate. We're talking about pharmaceutical companies, big, big pharma. Uh, if there are countries that require people are dying because they don't have access to medication, whether you can then go and create a generic brand without paying copyrights. There could be an argument to that, but that would be possible perhaps to do is save life, but there would still be a, a debt. Oh, but that's a different question about intellectual rights, intellectual uh, intellectual property rights. In Torah, that's a, a different discussion. I would need an expertise in that. I haven't studied that particularly. But be that as it may, Saving lives does not mean you have access to somebody else's funds. It means you have access to it, but there may be a, there is definitely a financial responsibility that needs to be reimbursed. So, Robin Hood doesn't work. But now let's see that we have some very, very harsh words about theft in general. It's not just as some would think, well, it's only money. It didn't do any harm. No, there is certainly the way the Torah looks at theft. Will put a uh, not just will give us a context that it's against God, not just against our fellow man. It's not just a societal thing. It's as we say, it's a mitzvah from God. Once it has a mitzvah from God, violating that will be offensive to God. How? Why? So let's first see what some of the quotes here are about theft. There's a quote from our sages. It says, "One who steals is considered to have murdered." What's more, he's considered to have served idols as well. Murders and idols, stealing, stole a couple of pennies, stole a couple of dollars. That's money. This is idolatry. Is a, is, is a personal uh, uh, insult, an insult to God. God forbid. Murder is, is, is 
one of the worst crimes. So the Maharal of Prague explained, what does this mean? So he explains, first of all, let's understand what theft is. Let's understand what theft is. But let's, let's see that theft has something that brings the... Uh, theft has something... Well, let's, let's look at the concept of murder. Let's look at page 53, the text from uh, the Tosfot and Baba Ratsia. Why is somebody who steals from his friend considered as if he's, he, he, he murdered him? Because one who steals is considered to have murder because sometimes the victim is starving and now has no money to purchase food. You don't know when you take something from somebody else, it may be that you've actually brought upon him a financial collapse where he doesn't have the wherewithal to provide for himself and his family. And so you've like murdered him somewhere. The lack of money can lead to death. It does in some places. There's a lack of money in some places. We're blessed today that in most cases, people don't have money. They say, I food, but that's not always the case. In some places, and but still, even today, no money means no nutrition. It means death in the long run. However, usually, when we talk about, about theft, it's not taking from a person his last few pennies in which he would bought bread. So how then do we understand in the general context why theft is somehow akin compared to murder? So here the, the, we have a quote from the Lubavitch He says like this, according to the Tosfot, theft is only akin to murder when the victim's loss is so great that he can no longer afford to feed himself. With this case, the theft can cause actual death. However, the Rebbe brings here a text from Maimonides will explain that even Sometimes when it's not the last few pennies, it can still be leading to murder. Page 54, the Rambam writes as follows. Desire, as in do not desire, do not covet. Desire when you want something that somebody else has leads to coveting. You covet something that somebody else, you want something that somebody else has, that leads to robbery. Because if he has it, and there's only one of them, you can't even buy it sometimes. Now, the only way to get what he has, if you really desire it very much, is to steal it from him. For if it not. <clears throat> you can offer him money, but if the owner does not desire to sell something, despite being offered a lot of money, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an art piece of art that there's only one in the world. Many people have asked that they've offered him a lot of money. So the person motivated by desire, what will he have to do? He'll be moved to robbery. And if the owner stands up against them to save his property, imagine he wakes up in the middle of the night, he sees someone trying to get his, his original Picasso, which is only one in the world, what's he going to do? He's also attached to it, he didn't want to sell for money. He may be trying to stop the robber. He tries to stop the robber, the thief may actually be motivated to murder. So we have a, a, a definite correlation that the act of stealing can lead to murder. So therefore, says the Rebbe, because robbery can lead to murder, the Torah considers one to have murdered as soon as the robbery takes place. Meaning, robbery is akin to murder not because the act of robbery causes death. Although that could be sometimes, like the Tosfa says, the guy is so deathly, so direly poor, he took his last few pennies, that means he has nothing to eat tomorrow and he dies. It could be. But even without that, theft, is something that can lead to death and therefore because it may lead to an action of murder we already our sages tell us that within the act of robbery there's a potential and there's a small act of murder potential and therefore it's akin it's considered as if the person has already because we look at what may come from it okay the fact is that you can say well come on who's going to murder for money. Not so simple. Money does have this powerful effect on us when we try to protect our possessions. A famous joke, the guy who said, your money or your life? The guy says, my life. I need my money for the vacation. I've been saving up for, for a whole year. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but sometimes people do that. 
Sometimes you'll find somebody that spends absolutely no time at home with his family because he's chasing after money. But what does he want the money for? He can think about that. Really, he wants the money in order to really wants the money in order to spend time with his family and to provide for his family. So he sometimes he gets so caught up with the money that he does things that sometimes even that shorten his life. He do something dangerous. He do something that's you know cause years of his life to be shaved off. God forbid, all for money. So there is. We, we, it could be that if somebody comes and tries to steal and so on, and there'll be a murder involved. Money does can lead to other things. So now, let's see, okay, we've explained how theft has an aspect of murderous, of a murder there in, embedded either because it took somebody's last penny, or because it could lead. The drive went unchecked, the drive for more possessions, the drive for more money, the drive of having something like somebody else could lead to murder. What about idolatry? So now let's think, how does a thief, what does a thief do when he comes to steal? What's the most important thing that a thief tries to protect? He tries to protect his identity. He tries to come in a way that nobody knows. He tries to come at night. He tries to disarm the cameras. He tries to put on a balaclava. He puts, puts on a, a, a mask on his face. Ah, so a person does that. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't want anybody to see me. But who's always watching? Hashem is always watching. There's a famous story, a beautiful story, that is a, a coachman, Balagola, driving somebody. The guy said, you see the king's orchards here on the side of the road, there's such luscious fruit. Do me a favor. Stop the coach and go and pick some fruit. But please keep watch. If you see somebody coming, because people, the soldiers, the guards, these call out so I can come out of way. He gets, he climbs up the fence, he's about to pick the luscious food, and the coachman calls out, he's watching, he's watching. The guy comes running back to the coach and gallops away. He looks back and says, I don't see anybody who really says he's watching. He said, he's watching. <laughs> Mighty God is watching. So when somebody comes and steals, what's he really saying? He's saying, I know about him. I'm not worried about him. I don't want anybody else to see him. That's akin to idolatry. That's in a certain subtle form that's being disrespectful of God. Like saying he's not here, like being an idol, like being a Gnostic, like being a, a, an atheist, or even worse, like ignoring it. So the Talmud says like this in Baba Kama, the student says, Rabbi Yochanan Zakai, why does the Torah treat a thief so strictly? Here's an interesting law. If a thief comes at night and steals something, yeah. he has to pay double for the score. If somebody comes in broad daylight, hold up, he doesn't have to pay double, he's considered a castle. The reason is, why do we treat a thief more strictly? Because he, he answers, says the Talmud, the thief acts as if God neither sees or hears. As the verse states, God has abandoned the earth and does not see. So he has actually taught, he's actually acted in a way where he totally disregards, where he totally disregards God's presence, God's overarching and constant presence. So therefore, theft, theft is truly considered, theft is truly considered an, an affront to God. It's also considered a, uh, it also considered something that can lead to murderous intent, which tells us like this. So when we talk about the mitzvahs that are mishpat, the mitzvahs that are understood by us in a context of societal morality. Whereas we know that, as we discussed before, if I steal from you, then I, you may steal from me. You know, there's a, an interesting, there's a nice joke as a kid. The guy lands in Italy, Milano, takes a taxi, the taxi tells him, don't tell him what's to go, the taxi starts zooming off, he gets to the red light and zooms right through it without looking. Oh, this guy's going crazy, you know. Even in Milan, red light should be stopped. He gets to green light, <laughs> screeches to all. So what's the matter? Why are you stopping to green light? He says, I don't know, maybe my brother coming the other way. 
<laughs> in other words, if I'm not stopping bread, if I'm not stopping bread, why should I expect, should I, why should I expect somebody else to stop bread? If, and, and if he doesn't stop bread, my life is in danger. So it's not about a policeman when I stop at a red light. Of course, if I look right and left and all around and there's no car, I may be tempted to, to do it. But then again, I would be smart to realize that maybe I'm having a temporary lapse and I'm not noticing that there's a car driving without lights or something like that. And if I do that, that creates a breakdown within the rules of road, road rules. And there may be somebody that will do the same to me. So we understand that. It makes sense. But Torah tells us about a mitzvah, we have to understand that there are many details within the mitzvah that may already go our way or, 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 or be beyond the scope of what societal morality or uh, human judgment would compel us to do. One of them, for example, discusses the Robin Hood syndrome. It would seem I can help myself to somebody who has too much for my own good, and even if I want to be altruistic for somebody else's good, comes the Torah and says, no, the rules of property ownership, the rules of ownership and theft, they are not for human arbitration. They are firmly set down. You may not steal. You may not steal from any other human being. What belongs to them belongs to them. You may not do it as a joke. You may not do it even if you assume it's okay. And therefore, when we steal, God forbid, it's not just an affront to our fellow man, it's an affront to God. And in this way, when we understand that doing the laws that God tells us to do are not only for the benefit of society, but they're actually creating and generating a relationship between us and Hashem. So this gives us the right perspective of, uh, of, of fulfillment of this. And it also ensures that even when we may <coughs> subjectively